Okay, so now we get to Little Miss Sunshine, which is embarrassing because that script is just nowhere near as great as Star Wars or The Graduate, but at least it shows how I was able to take lessons from those uh, scripts and apply them to a screenplay of my own. And I'm sorry, but I'm going to add one last disclaimer because, again, I just know I'm going to get roasted alive by people who are going to say that I'm trying to turn storytelling into a paint-by-numbers exercise, which is not what I'm trying to do. Like, all these storytelling ideas don't apply to the most important part of storytelling, which is just coming up with a great idea and with great characters and getting a first draft down on paper. So you can't use these story ideas to plot forward, okay? They only work in retrospect when you've already had that great moment of inspiration, you've laid down that first draft, and now you're just trying to find a way to turn it into the best version of itself, okay? It's like when all else fails, you read the directions, right? So end of disclaimer, let's look at Little Miss Sunshine. The stakes of Little Miss Sunshine are pretty easy to figure out. They're all set up in this following scene. There's no sense in entering a contest if you don't think you're going to win. So, do you think you can win Little Miss Sunshine? Richard. Are you going to win? Yes! We're going to California. So there it is. It's pretty simple. What's externally at stake in Little Miss Sunshine is whether Olive Hoover is going to win the Little Miss Sunshine contest. When I was writing the script, I thought, you know, what I was going to try to do was to have the smallest possible set of external stakes, but then have the emotional stakes and especially the philosophical stakes be as big as possible. So it was a deliberate choice on my part for a comedy to have the external stakes be as small as possible. Now, in terms of the internal emotional stakes, it's also pretty simple. Here's the scene in which we're establishing in the first act what's emotionally at stake in Little Miss Sunshine. You know, actually, there is a message from Cindy on the machine. Something about Little Mrs. Sunshine. Sunshine. What? Little Miss Sunshine? Yeah. What? Cheryl, it's Cindy. Remember when Olive was here last month? She was runner-up in the regional Little Miss Sunshine. Well, they just called right now and said, who won had to forfeit her crown. I don't know why, something about diet pills, but anyway, now she has a place in the state contest in Redondo Beach. <laughs> So I, I didn't even realize, like, what a crucial scene that was until after I wrote the script. And even after I sort of saw the movie, I realized, like, just, like, that moment of Olive, like, getting the news and reacting in such a, such a like, euphoric way, right, in such an emotional way, that was the thing that allowed people to jump on board with the movie. So you're establishing right at the beginning what's emotionally at stake in this movie is Olive's hopes and dreams. She wants to become a beauty queen. But it's not just about hopes and dreams, right? Because what you want is sort of in the middle of your story, you always try to sort of deepen the stakes of your story, reveal something that, that your audience hadn't suspected. So there's a scene in the middle of the movie that adds to the emotional stakes of the movie. Uh, so here it is. It's Olive and Grandpa in the motel room setting up the internal emotional stakes of the story. Grandpa? Yeah. Am I pretty? Olive? You are the most beautiful girl in the whole world. <laughs> You're just saying that? No, I'm not. I'm madly in love with you. And it's not because of your brains or your personality. It's because you're beautiful, inside and out. Grandpa? What? I don't want to be a loser. You're not a loser. Where'd you get the idea you're a loser? Because... Dad hates losers. So suddenly you're revealing that it's not just about sort of Olive achieving her hopes and dreams. It's also the story of this little girl who's trying to connect to her dad. You know, she, she's reaching out to her dad and she feels like the only way that she can do it is to be a winner because Richard is obsessed with winning. So now what you're putting at stake is not just like, is she going to achieve her hopes and dreams? But it's also her fear of failure and her fear of letting her father down. And so it's that bond between the child and the parent, that bond between Richard and, and Olive that's now being threatened and put at stake. And now we get to the philosophical stakes of the story. Once again, you just have your bad guy show up, give his antagonist Arya, and he's saying to the audience and to, to the characters, like, this is the way the world works. So here is the antagonist Arya for Little Miss Sunshine. There are two kinds of people in this world, winners and losers. Inside each and every one of you, at the very core of your being, is a winner waiting to be awakened and unleashed upon the world. 
So it's Richard, right? Richard is the philosophical antagonist of Little Miss Sunshine because he's sort of the, the embodiment, the apotheosis of the dominant values of this universe. He sees the whole world in terms of sort of winners versus losers. And his whole way of looking at the world is based on sort of status and rank and hierarchy and basically the approval of others. Like you're trying to be a winner and you're trying to at all costs avoid being a loser. And what's important is that these are the dominant values of this whole universe. It's not just Richard. Richard is the most sort of like virulent embodiment of these values. But everybody else in this, in this universe kind of shares the same sort of like, I want to be number one. I want to be a winner kind of values. So you have Richard. You know, he's a motivational speaker. He wants to be a success. He wants to be a winner. But you also have sort of, you know, Frank, who's sort of the highbrow version of Richard. He wants to be the number one Proust scholar in the U.S. <laughs> Larry Sugarman is perhaps the second most highly regarded proof scholar in the U.S. Who's number one? That would be me, Rich. What? And you also have Dwayne, who wants to be a fighter pilot, like who has this idea of just sort of, you know, joining the Navy and sort of like transcending his whole family. And I would call these sort of like the values of public life, you know, the values of sort of um, the marketplace where you're trying to, you know, sort of impress other people, you know, and avoid being seen as a loser. And so just as you have an antagonist in the philosophical realm, in Little Miss Sunshine, you also have a mentor. You sort of have an Obi-Wan Kenobi. And he's the guy who's going to sit down with your, with your hero and go, like, don't listen to all those other people. Like, here are the real values that are important in life. So here is the philosophical mentor of Little Miss Sunshine. I don't want to be a loser. You're not a loser. Where'd you get the idea you're a loser? Because Dad hates losers. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Back up a minute. You know what a loser is? A real loser is somebody that's so afraid of not winning, they don't even try. Now, you're trying, right? Yeah. Well, then you're not a loser. We're going to have fun tomorrow, right? <laughs> yeah. We can tell them all to go to hell. Good night, sweetie. I love you. So it's Grandpa, right? Grandpa is the Obi-Wan Kenobi of this movie. He's the mentor for all of it. He's the one who says, like, you know, we're going to have fun tomorrow. Like, we can tell them all to go to hell. Like, it doesn't matter what other people think. It doesn't matter if we win or lose. And so Grandpa, you know, it, it, for him, life is not about winning the approval of others. It's just about having fun, having pleasure, sort of freedom and autonomy. It's about letting yourself be defined by yourself and not being defined by others. And I would call those sort of the values of private life. You know, it's sort of the, the values of friendship, the values of romance, the values of creativity, the values of the spirit. Like, the things that other people can't see, you know, those are the values that, 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 that the grandpa sort of is all about. So you're setting up this universe in which sort of the dominant values of the universe, you know, are the values of the public self. You know, you live for others, you live for status. The underdog values of this universe are sort of the values of private life, you know, that you're going to just, you know, live for yourself. You don't care what anyone else thinks. And this is kind of the reason why I wrote the whole movie, which is, if you'll allow me to get up on my soapbox for a second... I feel like we all live kind of two lives. We sort of have two selves. We have our public self, which is all about sort of like wealth and position and status. It's all the stuff that's visible. It's all the stuff that everybody else can see and judge you on. But we also have private lives. We also have stuff that's hidden from the rest of the world. It's visible only to a few people, like only to a few loved ones. And that's, you know, your private life. And I just feel like we're at a point where the values of public life, sort of the values of the marketplace, the values of judging people as to being winners and losers is starting to seep in into the realm of private life and especially into the realm of childhood. And I just think that's terrible. I think that children need to be protected from those values, that childhood should just be about childhood. And um, what's important about these two sets of values is the public values of wealth, position, status, fame, success, you know, just being an adult, those are things that are not in your control. And the stuff in private life, love, friendship, creativity, those are things that are within your control. And as the Stoics say, if your happiness is dependent on things you can't control, you're never going to be happy. So Little Miss Sunshine was written to sort of stick up for the values of private life. Okay, so lecture over. I'm getting off my soapbox. So uh, Little Miss Sunshine, the page count, uh, we start even before the movie begins. We've established that Frank has failed. He's had this sort of failed love affair. You start on page one, you meet Olive, and she's practicing to be in a beauty pageant, but nothing's happening yet. Your inciting incident, bolt from the blue, changes your hero's life, changes their sense of the future. Aunt Cindy calls, says you've got a place 
in a Little Miss Sunshine pageant, right? So like Hamlet, the, the family sort of dithers and dithers and is trying to figure out what they're going to do and what they realize is they've all got to go to Redondo Beach. So your first act break, they set off, they all get in the VW bus, they take off, they're driving to Redondo Beach. So you get into your second act and of course things start going wrong. You know, sort of on page 37, Richard's book deal falls through. On page 50, at the midpoint, Grandpa dies. You get to page 62 and Dwayne like realizes he's colorblind, realizes he's never going to be a pilot, realizes his dream is all over. And a boom, it's page 75, you get to the end of the second act and they arrive at Redondo Beach. So you arrive at Redondo Beach and your heroes have achieved their second act goal, right? But now you're forcing the stakes of your global goal because Olive is now either gonna win the Little Miss Sunshine pageant, like she promised Richard, or she's gonna lose the pageant, but there's no going back. It's all or nothing, do or die, kill or be killed. And then you have your Judas moment of betrayal, right? You have the person who's closest to your hero go and stab them in the back philosophically, and that's Dwayne. Dwayne is Olive's closest ally. He's the person who's sort of the closest with her, and he looks around and he sees what's going on. He says, this place is fucked. And he goes back and he talks to Cheryl and he says, like, I don't want her to go on, Mom. Like, she's not a beauty queen. And Olive overhears this. Hey, how are you feeling? Better. Where's Olive? Here, what's up? Mom, I don't want Olive doing this. <laughs> oh, my God. Look around. Oh God. Oh, this place is fucked. Right. Look, I don't want these people right. judging Olive. Fuck them. Listen, it is too late. No, it's not too late. You're the mom and you're supposed to protect her. Everyone is going to laugh at her, Mom. Please don't let her do this. Olive Hoover, two minutes. Look, she's not a beauty queen. She's just not. And so when Dwayne goes backstage, right, he's seeing the world through Richard's eyes. He's saying, in this life, there's winners and losers, and Olive is not going to win, so I don't even want her to go on. So the third act, you want nothing but setbacks happening. So, you know, with Little Miss Sunshine, there's, there's setbacks happening all the way through the movie. So Frank has failed. You know, Larry Sugarman gets the guy. Richard fails. Stan Grossman rebuffs him. You know, Grandpa dies. Your philosophical mentor is gone. Dwayne fails. They arrive in Redondo Beach. Then you get to the swimsuit show, and you're just establishing visually that Olive is just kind of out of her league, and she doesn't fit in with everybody else. And then you get to the talent competition, and you show, like, oh, my God, all the other girls have these great, crazy kind of routines. And then you have Richard go backstage, and he says, like, I don't want her to go on. And you have Dwayne go backstage and say, she's not a beauty queen mom. And you get to your kamikaze moment of commitment where Cheryl sits down with Olive, right? And she says for Olive, like, we've come all this way. Like, we're proud of you. But you don't have to do this if you don't want to. So it's up to you. Like, you can either go on and dance or you can sit this one out. It's all up to you. And this is your kamikaze moment of commitment, right? Because this is the moment where your hero is sitting there and they have to make a choice. They have to decide what they're going to do. And there's two sets of values. And Olive at this point has heard there's no way she's going to win. And if she were living her life according to Richard's values, there's no sense in any consciousness we can't win she wouldn't go on. But there's something else. Like, she's got the voice of her mentor. She's got grandpa, right, who comes back and says, like, we'll tell them all to go to hell. We're going to have fun tomorrow. So listening to the voice of the mentor, again, Olive stands up, and she walks down, and she's going to go on. And again, what you want in a good sort of kamikaze moment of commitment, you want your audience going, no, 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 don't do it. Like, you want your audience freaking out and going, like, stop, stop, don't do that. So then Olive walks out on stage, and she's just, like, standing there, right? She's got a funny costume on, and at this moment, you want it to seem like Olive is doomed, like she's going to lose and be humiliated, and it's just going to be, like, the worst thing ever, and there's no positive outcome possible. So let's just play the climactic two minutes, and then we'll go back and we'll see how it works under the hood. So here it is, the two-minute climax of Little Miss Sunshine. Um, I'd like to dedicate this to my grandpa, who showed me these moves. Oh, that is so sweet. <laughs> is he here? Where's your grandpa right now? In the trunk of our car. Okay. Well, take it away, Olive.
Okay, so here's how it breaks down. Olive walks out on stage, and you get the joke about the trunk of the car, and then the MC leaves, and Olive is left alone on stage. And this is your moment of total failure, right? Because it seems like Olive is doomed. Like, she's doomed to external failure. She's not going to win a Little Miss Sunshine contest. And then there's an internal failure, too, because not only is Olive going to sort of, like, lose the contest and be humiliated, but she's also going to sort of hurt that relationship with her dad. And there's just going to be this overall, like, sense of family shame amongst the Hoover family because they're all such a horrible bunch of losers. And now you also have a philosophical failure, right? Because you're saying winning is more important than fun. Public image is more important than your private self. Competition is more important than just pleasure. And then you have your decisive act. So the music starts, and Olive starts dancing, and the decisive act is she tears her pants off, which means she's going to fail externally, right, because she's not going to win the Little Miss Sunshine contest. But at the very same instant, she's succeeding philosophically because she's enacting and affirming the values that Grandpa taught her back in the motel, right? We're going to have fun tomorrow, and we're going to tell them all to go to hell. And the last set of stakes is emotional, right, because you still have that relationship between Olive and Richard at stake. And at first, Richard's uncomfortable, right? He's embarrassed. But as he watches the audience heckle Olive, and then they get up and they start to walk out, Richard converts to the underdog values of the story, and he stands up and he starts supporting Olive. So Olive tears her pants off. She fails to overturn the external stakes of the story. But at the very same instant, she's affirming Grandpa's values, and that's overturning the philosophical stakes of the story. And then Richard stands up and starts supporting Olive, and that's overturning the emotional stakes of the story. It happens in 45 seconds, and that, I hope, is an insanely great ending.